pray pray together and get started. Thank you, each one, for joining this course, BC214, and the class to uh, develop in the human spirit. Thank you for joining the class today. Could um, somebody please lead us in prayer, and then we will get started. Okay. Um, go ahead. Go ahead, Maggie. Thank you, sir. Okay, let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you again this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your grace that you've granted us, Lord, to be here and to meet, Lord, so that we, we may worship you in the way of learning about your ways, Lord. And we pray, Father, as we learn about developing our spirit, Holy Spirit, broaden us, Lord, waken us, and also empower Pastor Ashish. We pray all this in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Good morning, uh, everyone. I see your comments uh, in the chat. Thank you. And um, we're going to... Uh, I want to uh, just answer one one point that had come up towards the end of, in the last last in the class last Monday, um, and uh, then we will finish up um, the section on analogies of the human spirit. That's in the same chapter that we were covering last week. We didn't have time to do that, and so we said we will spend time on it um, this week. So. Uh, that's our plan for today. Uh, we will um, uh, I'll just answer. So the question that came up last week, um, uh, as uh, we were actually talking about the effects of the human spirit on the soul and the body, and we just went through the list of uh, scriptures on various things, how the the condition of our spirit, the experiences, the uh, the um, the expressions of the human spirit affect our soul and our body. Uh, we talked about that, and then we talked about how words are very important. Our words affect our spirit, as well as when we speak words, you know, we can impact other people's lives uh, through the words we speak. Now, the question that came up was about God um, hardening Pharaoh's heart. And uh, so I just, um, you know, I, I went and looked at Romans chapter 9. Um, that's the passage that, um, and I'll just, you know, paste my comments here. Uh, it's actually something we uh, um, cover in, uh, in, uh, let me, I'm trying to paste this here. Um, yeah, it's something that we actually covered in, in our study on the book of Romans. Um, and uh, so I went and looked up um, that study. And uh, when we look at Romans um, chapter 9, especially uh, verses 14 to 24, where um, the Lord is, you know, Paul is writing about how God, as sovereign God, he speaks ahead of time uh, and uh, uh, declares things. And Paul is specifically re referring to Esau and Jacob, uh, he, uh, where God says, you know, I have Jacob I've loved, I've hated Esau. And that same context and same this passage, the Apostle Paul also refers to Pharaoh. Now this is Romans chapter 9, verses 14 to 24. He talks about Pharaoh, who, and, and he says, you know, God raised him up, or raised Pharaoh up to fulfill his purpose. And uh, and then uh, we also see that uh, there's this whole case, uh, and right after that, uh, Paul goes on to talk about the potter and, uh, and the clay, uh, how the potter works um, with the clay, you know, so that can also be, um, compared to what is happening. 
Now, I know uh, for those of you who have joined a little late, you may not be able to read um, uh, my notes, um, things that I've just put out here, but it will be in the lecture notes that, I, that come up in the next week's class, right? So uh, we're talking about this, this whole aspect of um, uh, God hardening Pharaoh's heart. So when you look at the scriptures there, you find uh, in Exodus, you find scriptures that tell us, and I've, I've put them out in the chat, uh, which tell us that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then you also find the other scriptures, Exodus chapters 9, 10, 11, and 14, uh, that tell us that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So you see both sets of scriptures in Exodus. And so how do we understand it? And does it mean that God actually hardens people's hearts so that uh, you know he kind of makes them do his will or now what what you know how do we understand it now um so i just uh, and if you look at romans 9 you, you understand it in the context also of the potter working on the clay the only difference between the potter and the clay and god and us is the difference between the clay and us the clay is an inanimate thing. It has no choice of its own. It has no expression of its own. Whereas we, as people, we understand that we have a free will. That means we have a choice and we have the ability to respond. So that's the difference between the clay and people uh, as the potter working on the clay and God working with us. There's that difference. So God is sovereign. And he does work in our lives, shaping and molding us just the way the potter works on the clay. But in our case, God's working in our lives will always have to happen, recognizing you know, our freedom to choose and our cooperation with him. Otherwise, we would be inanimate objects like the clay. So also, and as you put all of that together and say that, um, you know, how do we understand God hardening Pharaoh's heart? Or so we see that, you know, initially Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then it's coming on to say God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So I think the, the right way just to put it, and when I looked up Romans, how we interpreted Romans 9, uh, this is how we uh, interpreted it uh, in the light of what Paul had already written in Romans 1, that God gave people over. And in Romans 1, he mentions it three times, uh, verses 24, 26, and 28, that God gave them up. And it doesn't mean that God pushed them into sin, but God let them go on into their the choices they were making. And so when you when you look at that whole you know sequence of thought from Romans 1 to Romans 9, um, then you say, okay, you know, so we must understand Romans 9 in the light of Romans 1, uh, that that's how Paul is expressing it. Um, so then when Pharaoh is the subject there, so therefore we, we it's safe to conclude for us that Pharaoh began by hardening his own heart and God let him continue that way. And therefore, when in later chapters it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it's like, okay, God let him go on that way. That's the way you choose. I'm not going to try to persuade you otherwise. I'm not going to try to move you otherwise. I'll let you go your own way exactly how it's stated in Romans 1, uh, when Paul uh, states three times, God gave them over to their own you know, desires. So that's what we will uh, understand in this sense, when, when people are moving in a wrong direction. But at the same time, we've seen that God can also move upon people in a good direction, meaning either bringing them to repentance, or stirring them up to do His will, and even the unsaved, like King Cyrus and others, God stirs them up, moves upon them in a positive way. That means he's bearing, he's causing his influence to bear upon their spirit and move in a positive way. But it always happens with, you know, with their response in place. God is not overriding human response, overriding human will as he influences or as he gives up, you know, either way. He may move upon us toward something good, or he may take his influence off of us, letting us go on into something bad. In either way, it's always in respect, respect 
or in recognition of our own will. So that's how we will understand, you know, both sides, um, that the hardening of heart or stirring up of the heart. God influences us, but he doesn't override us. He always lets us move forward uh, with the choices we will make. Uh, is that okay? Uh, is that explanation okay? Uh, any follow-up questions on that, if you want? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, so go, you have a question? Sir. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, how can we say the same principle app applies to to Judah Iscariot? Because Judah had uh, he, he was stealing money from from uh, from 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 the group from Christ. Mm -hmm. And beforehand they had spoken to to the leaders of of the Jewish. So when it came time for him to betray Jesus, Jesus gave him bread and the, the spirit entered him. So could you say that God was, was only it he used the same principle that he used with Pharaoh? Thank you. Sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it's right to say that that's how God worked because um, uh, you know the very fact that okay so if you look at it from God's perspective even before Jesus began his ministry God already knew that Judas would be the one who was going to betray him and yet Jesus chose these 12 which included Judas but God already knew that this one of the 12, Judas, was the one who's going to betray him. And uh, Judas was part of the team, you know, for that uh, uh, three year, three and a half year period. He was part of the team. And like, uh, you know, we uh, we said uh, he probably was uh, taking money and all, of, you know, from the common uh, pool and all of that. And then at some point he conspired with the leaders to betray Jesus and God knew all of this. And surely at some point it was revealed to the son of God, Jesus Christ. And we know that because when he went around washing the feet and even, you know, John 13 he was washing the feet and, uh, uh, you know, during the, 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 what we call as the Lord's Supper. He said, Judas, whatever you have to do, go do it. It's like, I know what you're going to do. I know it's betrayal. But that's the choice he made. It's not like he's, God is sending him to do it, but God foreknew his choice, but it was his choice. And God was so merciful to give him this privileged place to be with Jesus, to be in the inner circle, to be one of the 12 that were chosen. So God was so merciful. But even though God foreknew his choice, but ultimately it was Judas' choice that, you know, that he went and betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So in that sense, you know, that's so the same thing applies. God let him do it, you know. So even Jesus speaking those words, Judas, go do what you have to do. And uh, Satan entering his heart, uh, you know, driving him to do it, is Judas giving, giving place, Judas by his will, giving place to what Satan uh, intended uh, against Jesus. Yeah. Okay. All right, Christopher, uh, I see your hand. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, Pastor. So I um, I wanted to understand, uh, you know, when um, there is a person who, is, um, who has a hardened heart and um, God is allowing that person to, you know, to continue based on his, on that, on that free will, uh, but there are uh, people who are close to this person who are who are praying for him, mm. and they're praying to God, and uh, you know um, uh, they're fully aware that if the person is 
got a heart and heart. Mm. Um, and in that instance, um, um, you know, we are, uh, or the people who are praying for him are, you know, imploring God to, to, you know, to intervene and, you know, to, to, um, to allow something, you know, miraculous to happen and, you know, uh, change the person's heart. Mm. So I just wanted to understand, you know, how that, how that will sort of, you know, play mm. out, um, in, you know, in that kind of scenario. Mm. Mm. Good, 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 good question. So, you know, when we are praying for somebody and um, they are willfully going you know, away from God, against God, etc. We must understand that um, there is a, a period of time when uh, sometimes they don't know themselves what they're doing or they're under deception. So the devil's deceived them. You know, the devil has blinded their minds. The devil has put wrong thoughts, wrong ideas in their minds. Um, and they are yielding to those thoughts. And so they are, you know, doing these things that are contrary to God's will and God's plan for their lives. So that is where us interceding, us engaging spiritually for them is very important. We are not trying to override their personal will, and we cannot. We are not trying to override their choice or dictate their choice. We cannot. But what we can do is to break the influence that is on their minds, the influence of lies, deceptions, ideas, things that the enemy is you know, bringing mm -hmm. to bear on, on their mind. So that's where our prayers, our intercessions are going to make a difference, that we are dealing with the negative influence of the enemy, and plus we are inviting the work of the Holy Spirit upon their lives through our prayer, our intercession, you know, and through us being um, yeah, a, a witness, if possible, if we have the opportunity, to being a, a close witness so they can see in our lives, now Jesus Christ. And so that's how we are going to make the difference. We're not overriding their will. We are not dictating their choice, but we are dealing with the influence. Because many times when people are going to that initial stage where you know, they seem to be rebellious, they seem to be you know, doing something that's totally against God, it's because they're confused in their minds with all the deceptions of the enemy, the lies, the imaginations, the reasonings, the arguments. And that's where, you know, uh, Paul, I mean, uh, one example, which I think all of us are familiar with, the 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 through 6, where Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And he says, look, you know, uh, we've got these weapons which are mighty through God, which can pull down strongholds. And, uh, and he's actually dealing with the things in the mind, you know. Now he's dealing with the, uh, the thoughts, the imaginations, the arguments, the things that are exalted self against the knowledge of Jesus. So he's dealing with that. So with, our, with the weapons we've given, we can deal with that. Ultimately, he says in verse 6, you know, uh, having in readiness to uh, avenge all disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled, that means, and so through that warfare, you're able to bring them to a place of obedience. You know, uh, it, it's not that we are forcing them, but we're dealing with other things. Now, however, so that's the positive part. And that's why we should engage in prayer and so on, intercessions, so on. But uh, we must also be aware that the scriptures in both the Testaments, the Old and the New, it's very solemn to think about this, that there are times when God says, don't pray, stop. You know, uh, example is uh, when Samuel was praying for Saul. God said, Samuel, don't pray anymore for Saul. You know, just don't do it. I'm not going to listen to your prayer. Come to the New Testament, 1 John chapter 5. John says, there's a sin unto death, and I'm not saying you should pray for it. Or Hebrews 6, you know, if a person continues on in willful sin, there's no more repentance for such a person. So, do we know when that is? No, we don't. Do we know when a person would cross the line? 
we don't. So from our side, we are going to keep praying, keep interceding unless God specifically tells us, hey, just let go. Right. So until that happens, we are going to pray and intercede. But we must understand that, uh, um, you know, uh, and this is very sad, but sometimes people can choose to go on and on and on in rebellion. And like Hebrews 6 describes it, when they reach a point when there is no more repentance. But that's not for us to judge, right? Um, that's something we don't know. Only God knows. And uh, so we continue to pray, trusting God for that transformation in the mind. Is that okay? Ah, yes, thank you. Um, and these prayers can be done for both uh, a believer and a non-believer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, for believers, we are using scriptures for non-believers as well. And for non-believers especially, uh, in John 13, you know, uh, the, whole, the Bible tells us when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That means he will convict people who are not yet saved, right, the world. He will convict them. He will work on their hearts and minds. He will convict them. Uh, sorry, this is John 16, not John 13. John 16, 8 to 11. Uh, he will convict them, the world, of sin, righteousness, judgment. So Lord, convict this person. He's not saved, but the Holy Spirit will do his work to convict him of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. So we are praying. And in, in, in alignment to what the Holy Spirit has come to do for the unsaved person. Okay. All right. So um, let's uh, go now to the last part of the. Uh, okay. I need to share the screen. So we're going to go to the uh, last part of uh, chapter four, which we didn't have time to finish last week. Um, I just want us to understand, uh, you know, think about this. It's very, very important. So we we, we covered till here, you know, we said that uh, words affect the human spirit. And so we have to be careful uh, about uh, our words. Uh, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Uh, it can bring healing, can bring strength and longevity. Uh, but perverseness in the tongue that's in our words, uh, it can destroy, it can crush, it can hurt the inner person, the spirit. Yeah. So we did till that. Now, I want us to just today, we have, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes left. And I want us to, you know, look at these analogies of the human spirit. It's very interesting. Because then it tells us how to take care of our spirit. So what you find in scripture is that there are comparisons of the human spirit to things that we are familiar with in our world. So that's what I mean by these analogies or comparisons of the human spirit. And these are in the Bible. So that means there is some relevance or there is some connection between the analogy, the comparison with our human spirit and some Therefore, we can understand from that. So uh, what are these comparisons? And then therefore, you know, what, what are things we must look at or understand about our human spirit, the inner person? Sometimes we don't think about it, but it's good to look at it. So uh, let's try to cover these, um, you know, uh, um, these seven uh, comparisons. Let's try to do it a little quick. Um, house. So the first one is the house. That means the human spirit, your human spirit, is like a house, a dwelling place. And uh, you find this in the Old Testament, as you uh, also in the New Testament. In Genesis four seven, uh, God uh, God is actually speaking to Cain, and He's saying, you know, now Cain has at this point what has happened is Cain has become jealous of his brother Abel. He's murdered him. So this is the first recorded murder. Cain has killed his brother. Or, uh, sorry, not yet. He's, he, sorry, not yet. He's, he's, he would do it. But at that point, uh, Genesis 4, 7, Cain is very upset. He's very angry with his brother because Abel's sacrifice has been accepted by God. Cain has not. Right? 
And in Genesis 4, 7, God is telling Cain, Cain, sin is waiting. I'm paraphrasing this. Um, God says, sin is waiting at your door. But you must have mastery over it. You must dominate it. So think about it. You know, if you look at that Genesis 4, 7, um, let me just read that here, Genesis 4, 7. Um, it says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, or it's it's trying to, you know, toward you. It's trying to get in, but you should rule over it. So, you know, God is using this picture. Sin is at your door. It's trying to get in, but you got to keep it out. And what's he talking about? What house is he talking about? What door is he talking about? He's not talking about his, you know, the physical house that Cain is dwelling. It's talk, he's talking about the human heart, the spirit. And in Matthew 12, uh, Jesus uh, himself uh, uses the same analogy. And in this case, he's uh, dealing once again with evil spirits. You know, he talks about casting demons out by the Spirit of God. And then in verse 29, he talks about, you know, how can you get into a strong man's house hmm? unless you first bind the strong man and then you will plunder his goods. So here's a, the house, which is the human spirit, the strong man, which is the demonic spirit inside that house. Now, and he's taking control of... Um, uh, you know the things that are there, but in order to you know recover control of everything inside, you got to bind the strong man. You got to overpower the strong man, the demon spirit, because this is the context that he's speaking of. And then in that same chapter, uh, verses forty-three to forty-five, he says, "Look, when an un unclean goes out of an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he's going through the dry places, looking for a place of rest." And then verse forty-four, he says. I will return to my house from which I came. So the spirit, now, you know, we're talking about a demon possessed man. I'll return to my house. And then he says he finds the house empty, sweat, swept in order. And so he takes seven more wicked spirits, get into the house. And the worst, the condition, the latter condition of the man is worse. So the human spirit, again, like into a house that is can be inhabited you know so uh, both genesis 4 7 and matthew 12 are dealing with the negative meaning genesis 4 7 sin is personified and sin is waiting to get in matthew 12 demonic spirits coming in and out of uh, the the, possess, the man who was possessed so that's the negative side but then the positive is also true right and we know that you know uh, uh, in uh, Revelation 3, verse 20, Jesus says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him uh, and I will, you know, eat with him and he with me. So uh, again, here the human heart is like the house. And uh, in this case, Jesus is standing outside, knocking on the door, wanting to come in and have fellowship with the, uh, the person. Right? So, our spirit is a home. It's a house. So your inner person. Now it's an analogy. It's a comparison, right? Uh, I'm not saying literally, you know, <laughs> you literally a house. It's a comparison. It's something for us to think through and learn some things about. So your spirit, a house. We can think about it as a dwelling place. It's really the human spirit is the dwelling place of God himself. It's the dwelling place where God puts, you know, the uh, God comes to dwell. A house is kept, should be kept clean, right? We, all of us, we clean our homes, we keep things in order. So we want to keep our home clean, our house. We have a right to who we allow inside and we don't. So of course, for us as believers, we want God 
to dwell with us. To be in, it's a place where God comes and he fellowships with us. Now, that's the human spirit. It's a place of dwelling. It's a place of communion, a place of quietness, cleanliness. So these are things you can think about in terms of a house. A second, and, and, and I want you to think about it further, all right? I'm just going through this, um, uh, this these, these comparisons uh, rather quickly. The second one is of a lamp, right? And Proverbs 20 and verse 27, uh, Solomon says, you know, the spirit of man, uh, the King James says, is the candle of the Lord or is a lamp of the Lord. Right? And he searches all the inner most parts. Um, let me just read that, Proverbs 20, 27. Um, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. Okay. Um, so what is the human spirit compared to? A lamp or a light, a torch light, if you want to look at it in modern terms. It's a lamp. It's a source of light. Now, there are two things that we could say. Uh, one, the, the psalmist says, the Lord will, will lighten my lamp. The Lord will lighten my lamp. I think it's in Psalm 18. I forgot to put these scriptures down. The Lord will lighten my lamp. And I'll give you the exact verse uh, if I find it very quickly here. Right. Um, yeah, it's Psalm 18 and verse 28. Psalm 18, verse 28. For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. So the spirit is like a lamp. What do you do with a lamp? You light it. So Psalm 18, 28. Psalmist says, the Lord will light my lamp. So that's one thing we can expect, that God would give us light in our spirit. He will light my lamp. So it's like an enlightening coming, you know. Now, sometimes we attribute some of these things to our subconscious mind. We think, oh, my subconscious mind is working. That's how this idea came. Okay, maybe to some extent, but don't forget that your human spirit is a lamp and God can lighten it. it means he can give light to it. You know, and light helps you see, it's like revelation coming. That's one thing. But Proverbs, going back to Proverbs 20, 27, it also says, the spirit of man is a lamp of the Lord, searching the inner depths of the heart. It's like God is using this lamp to search you out. The picture is really, you know, and if you see in your cross-reference in the margin of the Bible, it's like, it says, searching the rooms, the rooms of the belly, the innermost parts. It's like, you know, you're going through every room searching. Using this lamp, you're going from room to room to search. That's the picture there. Uh, uh, and it says, the Lord uses your spirit to search. That means, When God wants to see, or when God wants to, uh, you know, see who you really are, he looks into the spirit, what's really in your heart. You know, so he's not just looking on the outside, but God looks at the heart, and we know that. And he uses the heart, the spirit, to really search us out. Okay, this is what's really in your heart. Because on the outside, we can have all kinds of appearances before man. But God is looking and he's using the spirit of the man to search the man, what's in your heart. Because it's the lamp 
of the Lord. It's a lamp that the Lord uses to search out the person. So the lamp, so the, so the spirit is like a lamp. So think about it. One, God can enlighten me in my spirit. But two, God is using my heart to really see who I am. So I've got to be careful of what's in my heart. Because that's the place God is going to search me. Not the, not the outward appearances. He's using my spirit as a lamp to search the rooms in, in, inside me. A third analogy, and I'll try to give some time for questions before we wrap this up. A third analogy is a place of deposit. You know, uh, this is from Matthew 12, 35, but Jesus says, out of the abundant, um, a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. Matthew 12 and verse 35. It says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart. He brings forth good things, or it's the good deposit in his heart. What he has put inside. An evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And previously in verse 34, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the context is the heart is a place of deposit. And what you've put in there is going to come out. So, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And Jesus said, out of the good treasure comes forth good things. So, the heart is a place of deposit. What do you put in there? That will determine what comes out of your life. And it so closely correlates with Proverbs 4, 20 to 22, where God is saying, my son, attend to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them, health to all their flesh. Then he says in verse 22, Proverbs 4, 22, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it come spring the issues of life. So he says, guard your heart. Because out of your heart come the, you know, one person would say, the forces that shape your life. The, the, it's like the spring from which come things that shape your life. Out of it come the issues of life. The matters of life spring out of your heart. So it's a place of deposit. We saw Matthew 12, 34, 35. What you put in there is going to come out. Very similarly, Proverbs 4, 20 to 22, God says, put my word in your heart because out of it come the forces that shape your life. It's like a spring where the water that flows out of it, you know, becomes a mighty river and it could, you know, it could become a huge river. But your heart is like that. It's the first source. Out of your hearts come the forces that shape your life. So be careful what you put in there. Right. So both this place of deposit and this spring analogy, so comparisons, are telling us that you know what we put inside our spirit is going to shape our lives. And we have control on what we put inside. Because that treasure doesn't happen by accident. You determine what goes in there. In Proverbs 4, he says, you guard your heart with all diligence. That means you're like the watchman to your heart. And you're letting what goes into their heart. And then that's going to spring out. In John 7, it's a very interesting uh, passage where Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And he's talking about, you know, out of your belly your, or your innermost person will flow rivers of living water, which, of course, he refers to as, uh, um, 
the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. But in verse 38, the word that is translated heart is the word, is a Greek word that often use, is often used to talk about the womb. John 7, verse 38, where the English Bible says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It's not a wrong translation. It's just that it's talking about the inner person, the spirit. So translating it as heart is perfectly right. But the literal word is also, also means womb. That's very interesting that the heart would be considered like a womb. It's a place where conception takes place and things grow and from there come forth. So out of your womb will flow the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God will be released. So the human spirit is also compared to a womb, a place of conception, where the things of the Spirit are birthed and released. Last two. Of course, we we know this. It's the ground. Matthew 13, which, um, which is in the parable of the sower, the seed is sown on good ground, on good on ground. Jesus tells us, you know, it's sown in the heart. So the heart is like a ground or a field where things can be sown and then you have a harvest. That means I can intentionally sow things into my heart and reap a harvest. 30 fold, 60 fold or 100 fold. So the harvest that you want to see in your life will come out of what you're sowing into your spirit. And this is in line with, you know, what we read in Galatians 6, you know, it says, if you sow to the spirit, you'll reap of the spirit. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh. So the heart is a place where you can sow good seeds and reap a good harvest. Or if we don't sow or we sow bad seeds, then that's what's going to happen. And the last comparison that we see in scripture that, that I just want to point out is in 2 Corinthians 3 and 3, where Paul is writing the Corinthians and he says, you know, you are an epistle ministered by us. So he's saying you are letters that we have written, if you want to put it in simple English, right? He's telling the Corinthian believers, you are letters that we have written. He says, okay, where did you write? What did you write? He says, you are letters that we have written, not ministered with ink, not written on tablets of stone. That means it's not that we're writing on natural things with natural means, but he says, it's been written on he refers to it as fleshly tables of the heart, or it's written on your spirit. Not by ink, but by the spirit of the living God. So here in 2 Corinthians 3, 3, the human spirit is compared to, uh, you know, something you write on. In those days, Paul was comparing to, you know, tables or something that you're, you know, uh, tablets of stone or tables on which something is written. In modern terms, you would you know think about paper or you know a document, whatever, something where you write. But he's saying, I'm writing on your spirit. And by the spirit of the living God. That means things can be imparted to our spirit or if you want to think in terms of other people, you can write into the hearts of other people or they can write into your heart. That means they are leaving an indelible impression in your spirit. They are, they are marking you in your spirit. They're imparting to your spirit. They're conveying truth to your spirit, whatever, you know, however you want to you know, talk about it. But the human spirit is a place where things can be inscribed, imprinted, that you can capture by the Holy Spirit. So think about this for your own personal self. You are a house, your spirit is a house. It's a lamp. 
it's a place of deposit. It's from where things come out of your life. It's a womb from where you conceive and birth the things of God. It's a ground where you sow into and you can reap in your life. And it's a place where things can be written upon. So what are you letting be, writ right, be written upon in your spirit? And think about it in a personal self. And think about it for the people that we minister to. They are a house. They are a lamp. They are a place of deposit. Their spirit is a spring. Their spirit is a womb. Their spirit is a ground. Their spirit is a table where you can write upon. So when you minister to them, minister from that perspective. Okay. Um, let me pause here. Well, let's take some time for questions, and then maybe, you know, we could uh, we could uh, continue this further next uh, week if we need to, or move into a new chapter. Let me see now. Um, Abraham, is the same. Uh, uh, is this the same as an empty vessel that must be filled with good or bad things? Yeah. So you could look at it also as a vessel, as a container. That's a good analogy. Um, uh, Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians 4, that uh, we are earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not from us. So we could compare it that way, as a house that must be filled or as an earthen vessel that must be filled. That's fine. Right? Uh, Matthew 12, 29, is he referring to the devil, the strong man? Yeah. So in Matthew 12, 29, Jesus says, you know, how can you bind the strong man? So if you look at verse 28, it's actually Jesus actually just cast an evil spirit out um, by the Holy Spirit. So the strong man here is referred to as the evil spirit that's controlling the other person. You know, he's pictured as a bully, as a, a strong man, as an oppressor who's gone in and taken control of that person's house. That is the spirit, uh, the human spirit. So the evil spirit has gone in and taken control of the human spirit, gone into the human spirit of the man and taken control. So Jesus, you know, we, we have to bind the strong man, get rid of him. Yeah. Okay. So uh, any other questions on this? When he, when he comes, he finds empty sweat, put it on the... Yeah, so um, Christopher's question is uh, from the latter part of Matthew 12. So so what happens is, you know, when an evil spirit is expelled out of the house, the house is empty, doors are open, nobody else is inside there to protect the house, right? So what does he do? And if he finds the house empty, he goes and gets reinforcement and comes back in. Right. So what we need to do is when we minister deliverance, we need to get that person to receive Christ so that Christ can come in and be, and so that this person can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so his house is occupied by somebody greater, right? That's the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so then when the evil spirit tries to come back, cannot enter, why? Already occupied, the greater one is dwelling there. Yeah, Christopher. Uh, yes, Pastor. So I was just uh, trying to um, you know, think through this, uh, uh, you know, this aspect of um, developing the the human spirit um, and its its uh, its state uh, in that development process, um, where um, because it needs to be developed. Um, is it um, is it a is it in a, in a, in a weak state? Um, is it in a yeah, um, in an evil state? Um, uh, uh, and um, you know, how would how could how can we represent or how can we uh, describe the human spirit in 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 the in its in its stages of development, where um, uh, it has to get strengthened it has to be in alignment with uh, with um, with god and thereby you know it will positively influence the soul and and the body mm. um uh, is it so my question is um in that development process would it be 
right to say that um, it, it is going through uh, this refinement process. But in that refinement process, it is also, um, uh, in a sense, um, uh, evil uh, because it's not, you know, not, I mean, it may have things that are not, not of God. So, okay. So let's look at it. Let's, um, you know, we draw a distinction between um, the unregenerate or the person who's not born again and a person who has been born again. So let's talk about a person who has been born again. So when the human spirit is born again, uh, one of the analogies we used uh, in, in, I think, in, the earlier in one of the earlier chapters is that of being a baby, being a young person, and being a father or mother. So John brings this out, right? We saw in from First John uh, chapter 2, right? He says, you know, he calls them your children. He calls them young men and he calls them fathers. So these are spiritual comparisons of where they are spiritually. So for a believer, there's this human spirit intrinsically is not evil because we are born again. We have the life and the nature of God, which we have mentioned earlier. But there has to be growth, spiritual growth, meaning just like how we saw this comparison. I think that's a good comparison, being children, being young and being fathers and mothers so it's a growth in maturity it's a growth in strength it's a growth in responsibility and in these comparisons we can draw from human side as well we can understand it so that's the growth and in this process of course we want to keep all the wrong things away right so that's what the bible says you know to guard our hearts to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit because the sin would sin would try to attach itself and impair growth so you, even if you want to think of sin, we can think of it as some sort of a sickness that hinders the development of the person. And so that's a co good comparison to do it. When you think about the unregenerate, unregenerate person, then you think about death and life. You think about darkness and light, which we have seen before, that when we are without Christ, we are dead spiritually. It's the absence of the life of God. But when we are born again, we come, we receive the life of God. Or uh, uh, we are in darkness, under the control of Satan, but then now we come into light, to the kingdom of God. So those are comparisons, uh, you know, to describe what is happening in the spirit, the human spirit. So then how does, it, how does this explain, um, you know, a person who is born again, and um, who is leading a, a degenerate life, um, maybe through self-deception or, uh, um, you know, what is, what is his, um, you know, how clean is that spirit of his, uh, of, uh, you know, of, um, how clean is that human spirit of his? Mm -hmm. uh, mm. So, uh, one, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would look at two things. One is I would look at the mind, that there is a lot of deception in the mind, you know. Uh, so when you see, think about a believer, somebody who's born again but living a messed up life, uh, you say like, "Hey, this person's born again, but is living like this. What could be wrong?" Well, one is mind. They haven't renewed the mind to the body, the flesh. They haven't crucified the flesh, right? So these are the two problem areas: the mind and the flesh. But what would be the condition of the spirit? the spirit would be contaminated, right? Because um, these things are attaching itself to the spirit. And that's why we need to cleanse ourselves from it. But this person is not doing it. And he may not even be in proper fellowship with God because all of these sin would hinder the fellowship with God. But that's the state of a person who has received Christ, but is being controlled by carnality, you know, carnal minds and flesh. Is that okay, Christopher? Yeah, okay. Okay. All right, so uh, we will, uh, I think we, we will probably touch upon some of these things ahead, coming up ahead as well, so uh, it should become a little clearer. Uh, let's uh, dismiss now. I uh, We've taken five minutes into our, um, into our, uh, break time so we will dismiss please take a quick break and i will see you in our 
next class. Thank you, everyone. I hope you are learning. Everybody's very quiet, so I am not sure, but I, I think uh, you're, you're getting these things. Uh, we'll continue next week. God bless. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you in the next class shortly. Bye now.